Today's guest is Angela Marusas. Angela has had four near-death experiences, which we will learn about today. Angela, thank you so much for joining me and welcome. Thank you. All right, Angela, if you don't mind, let's start with your near-death experiences. Would you like to start with your first one or would you like to kind of set it up and tell us how it all came about? We'll start with the first one. So my very first one, I was 11 years old and I was driving with my grandfather and my sister at the time. I was in the front seat of the car and my grandfather obviously was driving and my baby sister was asleep on the back seat. And we were traveling north of here and it was like February, it was winter and the roads were icy. And my grandfather was driving along and I was listening to a cassette player. And for those of you who remember those, the when you're listening to those, the mechanism engages the tape. And I can remember I was listening to the music because he wouldn't allow the radio on and the cassette fell out in the middle of a song. And I remember being annoyed. Uh, and as I bent down to pick up the cassette tape, I don't remember anything until um, I heard a voice. And I had my eyes closed, squeezed shut, and I could feel my body. I was in a ball. And I could hear this voice, and it wasn't my grandfather, and it definitely wasn't my sister. And I was trying to place it. And it said to me, it's okay. You can open your eyes. And immediately, I just squeezed them tighter. And uh, a couple of seconds seemed to go by, and the voice again said, it's okay, Angela. You can open your eyes. You need to get out of the car now. And so when I opened my eyes, I was actually curled up on a ball and tucked against the windshield and my feet were on the um, ceiling of the car because we had rolled over into the ditch and gone down an escarpment. And so when I did open my eyes, um, it was a two door car and it had a metal rectangular um, door handle that you would put two fingers in to pull and it seemed to glow and so I reached up and I pulled on the lever and I stepped out of the car. And as I did that, I turned and I started up the embankment. And as I climbed up the snowy embankment, I noticed a transport truck coming towards me. He would have been traveling in the same direction we were. And as he got closer, he was breaking because he saw this small child coming out of a ditch. Chances are he probably saw the car down in the ditch sitting so high on the road. And as he got closer and was breaking, all of a sudden sound rushed in. And I hadn't realized that I hadn't heard sound until it rushed in and I put my hands over my ears. And so he pulled over and suddenly there were other people around who had been traveling in the opposite direction. And I remember standing at the side of the road and then looking back down um, at the vehicle and they broke the back window um, because as a two door car, they were trying to figure out how to get my sister out. And she had to crawl out on the snow. So she had ended up with scrapes from the broken glass. And then my grandfather was um, wedged behind the steering wheel. None of us had seatbelts on because grandpa didn't wear seatbelts and he didn't argue with us. <laughs> and so um, a police officer came along and we were, a, we weren't too far from a small community. We were about halfway between my grandparents' place and ours. And so he put us into the cruiser and and took us up to like a medical clinic. There's no hospital. And so along the way, he was asking my grandfather questions. And my sister was looking at me confused. Um, she had apparently slept through the whole thing. The breaking of the glass is what woke her up. And then she was laying on the um, ceiling. So she was she's three years younger. So she was, you know, a little unsure. Um, 
when they checked us over, I could hear them saying like they had no seatbelts, but they have no concussions. Okay. There's, you know, some glass issues there for the little, for the one little girl, the other one, nothing. Uh, and for the grandfather, there was some bruising where he had basically got hung up and suspended with the steering wheel. And so grandma came to pick us up. Uh, she was not very happy. Um, and grandpa was very quiet. He was always a quiet man, but he was a lot more quiet. And I can remember that in the days that followed, um, he seemed sad. And so I just picked up on this energy like he thought that he had hurt us, he had scared us. And so I was going out of my way to, you know, say that, you know, we were fine. Um, I'd asked if anybody else, you know, had heard the voice and no one had any recollection of what I was talking about. So this is the early 80s at this point. So now we fast forward to... Um, 2010, 2011. And the interesting thing about my near death experiences is the one before foreshadows the next one in terms of elements. Um, so, what happened is I was traveling home from the southern part of our province, um, and it was an unseasonably uh, warm spell. And so, there I was, um, there was another person in the vehicle with me. We were coming back from vacation, heading home to see our kids. And as we came along this four lane highway, we were going up and down hills and there was a transport and a rather large hill in front of us. So I pulled into the faster lane. And as we came down to the bottom of the first hill and about to climb immediately to the next one, there was some water. Um, what I didn't realize was that it was actually a full puddle that had formed there and had not had time to be, you know, wicked away off the road. So when I passed through that puddle, I was about halfway along the tractor trailer um, actual trailer and I started to hydroplane and it happened pretty quick but as it was unfolding like the impact into the water and the feeling of hydroplaning seemed to have felt like a speeding up but once we started hydroplaning under the transport time began to slow way down and I felt like I was in a protective bubble and I was looking at the other person in the car and I heard, take your hands and your, take your hands off the wheel and your feet off the pedals. And I did it. And I looked at them and they, they were like, what are, you, what are you doing? What are you doing? You, you have to get us out of this. And I'm like, okay, so it wasn't you who said that. <laughs> All right. And so as we started to go more under the trailer, I suddenly recognized the rectangle, the metal rectangle. And this time it, of course, was a reflector on the side of the trailer. And so as we went under the trailer, this reflector started coming up the hood of the vehicle towards me. And all of a sudden it caught in the hood of my truck about a foot maybe from the windshield in front of me. And when it did, I could feel the tires kind of buckling a little under us. And so the transport actually, we hooked onto him and he dragged us another 50, 60 feet um, before he could stop because he was on this hill and he had already gained a lot of speed trying to come up and down these. And so while that was going on within the vehicle, it felt like a really warm, protected space. And the other person wasn't panicking anymore. And I recognized that I hadn't panicked. Um, and so the vehicle came to a stop and I just opened the door and I stepped out and there were these vehicles behind, uh, behind us who had pulled over. Um, and of course, 
they couldn't get out except to climb over the center console. And so I stood there looking at this transport, this huge transport and my little truck and being tucked underneath it. And I kept looking at the little reflector and it dawned on me. And I'm like, I've seen that. I've seen that triangle. uh, It's not triangle. I've seen that rectangle before. And I remembered the car accident from being 11. And I thought, okay, well, it came in handy this time too. So um, the provincial police, Uh, were coming up the road and he was racing to get to our site and he hydroplaned in the same puddle but he was able to pull it together because nobody was next to him and he was able to get himself uh, back in the lane and when he got out of the vehicle he looked at me and he went you don't even have to say how it happened I know how it happened and so of course they sent ambulance and things and we sat in the ambulance for 45 minutes and the attendants just kept saying you know, you got to sit here a little longer. They were waiting for me to go into shock. And I just kept saying to them, no, you don't understand. We were safe. We were protected. Uh, and I said, um, I've kind of been in this position before. And I'm like, it's okay. Uh, it just was meant to happen this way. And they didn't really believe me. But after 45 minutes of sitting there, they had to concede. And so they dropped us off at the next community so we could call um, family or friends to pick us up. The interesting thing for me is that the other person in the car, they're panicked. And then I kind of asked them as we were waiting, you know, I was like, well, like, did you hear, did you hear like another voice? Because I had distinctly heard being told to let go of the wheel, let, you know, take my feet off the pedals and that I was okay. And they're like, no, there's no one else in the car. And I'm like, okay. And then the the usual behavior um, kind of came back into play. This other person didn't want to talk about it. And so by the time we were picked up, it was like I couldn't, I wanted to see what they had felt. I was trying to understand, like, was this just my perception or were you perceiving the same thing? But they kind of clammed up on me. And that felt like it did when I was a child. So the water element continues, um, but the transports don't. So in my third near-death experience, which happened approximately two years after that one, um, it involved a boating incident. In all of my near-death experiences, water is the primary element. Um, So we rented a cottage with extended family and they picked up a boat from a friend and i didn't grow up on lakes i didn't grow up boating but when they put this boat in the water it was like a small aluminum boat and it had a motor that i couldn't even put my hands around but it sat like this (laughs) and i looked around the marina and i went no other boat does that And so my husband was like, he grew up on lakes, he grew up boating, and he's like, that's really not a good idea. And I'm like, okay, let's put it back on the trailer. I trust you. This is not my thing. Um, But curiously, he's like, I'm going to show you why this isn't a good idea. And I didn't buck it. I got in the boat along with um, the person who had borrowed the boat and their spouse stayed behind with our four children. Um, And we went out to the middle of the lake so we could be shown why this was a bad idea. And I remember saying, well, you don't really have to convince me, but okay, I'll go because I trusted this person. And I kind of felt like the other person who had borrowed the boat was a little angry that we were, you know, poo-pooing the idea of using this boat. And so we get up to the middle and because of the way it sits in the water, they have to go to the front of the boat. He sits in the middle and and I take um, the stick. I mean, there's not even a steering wheel. It's a stick. And so two hands on the stick in idle and like, I can barely keep the boat from the motor from slamming against the back of the boat. And I'm like, okay, you don't have to convince me. I've touched it. I'm done. It's all good. And he's like, no, no. And so I tried to move it, just flex my wrist a little bit. And the minute it jumped forward, I just sort of panicked. 
So he's like, okay, you have a healthy respect for why we're not doing this. And I'm like, if that's the reason we're here, okay. And so now it was the other person's turn. And there was definitely, there had been leading up to that day, there had been a little bit of like competitive energy um, with this person. Not that I felt like I was competing, but there just seemed to be this air of like, that maybe I blow things out of proportion or maybe, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm being soft so that people will, you know, do things for me, whatever the case may be, just had this really slanted view that had sort of come out of nowhere at me. So when they took the stick, you know, I was getting the rolling eyeballs. This is not a big deal. You know, I've done you a favor. I'm, you know, doing nice things for my children and your children. And I'm like, whatever, like you're about to see. And so they took the stick and they literally looked at me and grinned and completely flexed their wrist. And the boat, the boat shot forward. Uh, the motor smacked against the back of the boat and we started doing donuts and their idea of a good idea was to to let go of the stick and to stand up and put their foot on the outside of the boat I think they call it a gunnel and propel themselves into the center of the donut we were doing the minute that they gunned that boat time started to slow down again. And I recognized the time slowing down. The time actually went void uh, because I could see that my husband was frozen, reaching to try and move himself towards the back of the boat to recover that motor. But this person was more than halfway out of the boat. But I could see that I had total and complete movement. And my instinct was to grab them. And so I reached up standing in the boat and I pulled them back into the boat and I slammed them down between the front and the middle seat. And then I, I proceeded to fall on top of them. And as we came down, time started to started back up in a slow motion. And my husband was coming over the top of us to try to get to that motor position, but he was moving he started moving a little faster and I noticed we started moving a little slower. Um, and so, and the donuts were no longer happening. Like everything had gone void. So it's slowly the time sped up, but my husband, his timeline seemed to be just that little bit quicker so that he could pull us out of that donut. And again, once he got a hold of the stick, and recovered the engine time had now come back to like present moment like things were moving people were moving um they were not very happy to find themselves slammed in the bottom of the boat with me on top of them um but and we didn't say a word i really didn't i didn't know what to say um they were already clearly upset at things and so it was a really quiet ride back in and I remember looking at my husband and really wanting to ask him again like anything anything this time like did you did you see did you hear now I didn't hear anything but it was an instinctual knowing this time that it was like no you're gonna have to pull this together you're gonna have to pull this person back in the boat and they gave me the time to do that um, and they also gave him the time to recover the boat so when we got back to the dock, um, this person's spouse was there and they just looked at us and he looked at her and went, what did you do? And it was just like, oh, that was the worst thing you could say. Um, so after that near death experience, that relationship literally exploded. Um, I have no idea what her perception is of what happened out there, but at the end of the day, um, there were some interesting choices made and there was definitely, you know, something much bigger than us taking care of all of us and allowing us the time and space to correct that. Uh, and I was very grateful. 
I did attempt again to find out, you know, in roundabout ways, what people had perceived or not perceived with me. But again, they just, I don't know if they don't perceive it, or they just don't want to talk about it. It could be a bit of both. So the element of water continues into my last and my fourth near death experience. Um, And it happened approximately three years after the boating incident. And I was swimming at a local lake and it was a really windy day. And so we were playing in the waves. And so, you know, you bounce between the waves uh, and I fell out of sync with the waves. And the person I was swimming with, um, we had been having some issues in our friendship. And so this was a day where it was just like we were trying to mend fences. And so we thought we'd go and we'd have some fun. We'd play in the water, uh, you know, take the pressure off talking, um, but putting some time in. And so we were out in the waves and I fell out of sync. Um, And I also had managed to um, come into a deeper part uh, of the lake. And so I was no longer able to stand, not even between the waves, but I wasn't even hitting between the waves. I was literally coming up between the, like in the waves. So it wasn't too long before I started to feel that bubble effect of like that calm sensation that I get when the near death experiences are happening. Um, But this time I panicked because I could see that the person I was with, they had managed to move themselves uh, into more shallow water. And they were actually standing there watching me struggle, uh, coming up in the waves, watching me fight for my breath, watching me try to fight to get myself closer to shore, closer to them. And each time I would barely catch like a glance, I could see they were just looking at me and I could feel the creep, the feeling creeping in. And I thought, no, <laughs> I'm not going out this way. There's no way. Uh, and so I struggled. And finally, when I managed to say help, it was a choice between breath and help. And I said, help. They stepped forward and they pulled me into safety. And I remember being smart enough to be like, don't ask the question right now because you're still out in the lake. But when we got to shore, it was like, you know, I'm like, did you not see me struggling to breathe? Did you not see that I was like in trouble? Um, And they were like, unless you asked, you know, I wasn't thinking I needed to do anything. And I thought that was a very strange reaction. Um, And so basically that was another relationship that really has not, not done well since that time. Um, There wasn't anything for me to ask other than did you not see that I was struggling because I knew the feelings um, from all of my others. It's like being in a bubble of like compassion, of gentleness and feeling like everything is just, it's, it's okay. You don't have to panic. And so I couldn't compare that in the last one. The interesting thing for me about my near death uh, experiences is that I actually have a foreshadowing and what I call a conclusion to my near death experiences. When I was five, Um, I was in a vehicle traveling the same highway where the accident happened when I was 11 and my mom gets really bad migraines and she gets tunnel vision. And so I would be five, my sister would be two. And she tells the story that the migraine set in and she thought she could get all the way home. Um, But in the end, she said it was overpowering to her Uh, And all she could see, she came up behind a transport and all she could see were the rectangular reflectors on the back. Um, It was a very low car. So on the actual lower bumper type of situation. And so she followed that for an hour to get back into like city limits where she kind of felt confident enough that she could 
pull the car over. Um, on those north highways in where I live, there really aren't shoulders in the winter. So it was another winter. And so again, we have the water element with the snow and we have the transport, we have the rectangles. And that was before I, you know, have any memory of anything. So after the drowning incident, approximately six months later, um, I went on vacation with a friend of mine and on our final day, we were um, getting ready to leave the city and to come home. And so we had, I had a day of sort of synchronicities. And the reason why I think that it closes the current pattern, if you will, of my near-death experiences is because there were synchronicities for my events. So I had a major car accident in 2017 where a woman T-boned me about two blocks from my house. She went through the intersection at 60, looking at the uh, green light in front of her instead of the stop sign before <laughs> the green light in front of her. Um, and so on this particular day, we decided to stop at um, a big department store that we don't have where I live. And there were a lot of people, it was very icy. And out of nowhere, this woman came flying between in two scenarios. And she came towards me uh, and she was gonna T-bone us. And as she was coming, it was like, my, I was like, okay, we're, we're gonna do this again. Really, we're gonna do this again. And all of a sudden she came to a dead stop. And I had let go of the wheel. I had let go of the pedals. I was like, I had said to my friend, don't hold on to anything like the impact. You'll only get hurt. And my friend opened her eyes and she was like, did we get hit? And I'm like, uh, no. And I looked down and she was like six inches uh, from my door. And I was like, oh, good. We're not doing this again. And I just looked at her. I said, you know, what? we're going home. Um, I don't care about shopping anymore. And so we got onto this eight lane highway and this winter storm uh, blew up and we couldn't see anything really in front of us, nothing behind us. And we also couldn't see the lanes to our side. And so she's like, well, you know, maybe we should pull over. And I'm like, those other lanes, I tried to, I was running in about the, the third lane and the other two lanes closer to the shoulder, I'm like, they haven't plowed them. Every time I try to go over there, like the vehicle pulls and I'm like, I feel comfortable for some reason in this lane. So I'm staying in this lane. And she's like, okay, you're driving whatever you want to do. And about a minute later, I saw a shadow of something coming up alongside of us. And then as it got closer, I was like, oh, it's a transport. And then I saw the yellow reflector on the side of the transport and I looked at it and it was like the clearest thing. And I looked at my friend and she went, oh yeah, I know how this story goes. And I went, no, I said, we're following that out. I said, it saved my life more than once. It's getting us out of this. And literally for the next hour and a half, that's all we could see was that little yellow reflector. And I just did my best to position myself like alongside of it and carry on um, and we came out of it so by the time we got home I was like you know what I think the pattern is done and uh, she's like well time will tell <laughs> so those are those are my near-death experiences well thank you for sharing them with us so who do you think that voice was that was talking to you I think it was an angel I think it's I think it's Archangel um, Metatron or Archangel Michael. There, there's just a feeling that comes with it. And I know Metatron is the voice of God and it didn't, but it was just so soft and it really didn't feel like it had a gender, but the feelings that come with it, it's, it felt angelic to me, which is the way I'd describe it. Interesting. I mean, my biblical knowledge is pretty small. I've never heard of Archangel Metatron. Yeah, Archangel Metatron. Um, sometimes nicknamed the um, voice of God. Hmm. 
Um, his my awareness of him really only just sort of came more into my knowledge maybe in the last four or five years as my own spirituality and my own self-discovery mm -hmm. came into play mm -hmm. um and you know when i read something about him being the voice of god i was like okay yeah because there's this disembodied voice that shows up and you know wants to soothe me wants me to realize that i'm okay in these situations so i'm i'm gonna go with that until he tells me otherwise <laughs> do you feel that this archangel is your personal guardian angel or just an angel that senses that you're in trouble and shows up i think he is probably part of my spirit team i think that i have angels archangels and guides different types of guardians mm -hmm. um i've always felt that way so definitely part of the team mm -hmm. in your first nde you were looking down i think to find the cassette on the floor and i don't think you ever mentioned what happened but i'm guessing that maybe your grandfather slid in the snow or something um actually the official report suggested uh, that he either slipped on the ice and we launched over a road, we hit a road sign, uh, which launched us over and over end down mm -hmm. into the ravine, um, or that he fell asleep at the wheel. Hmm. Either way, we went off, um, we, we managed to crean off the road at, uh, just the right moment, just the right time. Um, and there was a metal one of those slender metal posts there, I guess, with a road sign. And we hit that and it launched us. Maybe he did fall asleep since he was so quiet about talking about it. So, yeah. And it, as, as I grew older, um, there was, you know, talk about him having things like sleep apnea and things like that. And of course, when I was a kid, I'd never heard that word before. I'm not even sure how popular that diagnosis would have been. Um, but yeah, he was, he was a gentle giant and he would fall asleep in his chair and things like that, but he was a hardworking man. So mm -hmm. I don't really know exactly what happened because I bent over and I remember being very annoyed though about that cassette tape. And when I was bending down to pick it up, I also was very aware that like, how could that happen? <laughs> because cassette tapes, you know, the, um, the thing has to engage the tape to actually be playing and it was playing and then fell out and I hadn't touched it. It was resting on my lap. So there was annoyance and then there was curiosity. And I think my near death experience at 11 really sparked my curiosity about, well, things that happened that everybody says shouldn't happen, but it's like, yeah, but I experienced it and it did happen. In your opinion, is there some kind of symbolism why all these happen around water? Yeah, because so uh, water is a symbol for feelings and emotions and feelings and emotions in my life have been something that I sort of struggled with. People in my family, emotional, sharing emotions, emotional outbursts, people being emotional tended to be judged rather harshly. Um, and so I think part of my growing up and my discovering my own power and discovering my own voice is really trusting my feelings and trusting my instincts and not trusting other people's, what they say I should feel, what they say I should say. Um, I think growing up, we all go through that period. You know what I mean? We learn from the people around us. But as I continued... I started to really see where it was like, well, no, I didn't want to be silenced. And I didn't, I had feelings about things and I had understandings from my own perspective and I had to learn to stand up for those things. Do you feel like you've had any type of spiritual transformation with your feelings and emotions after all this? Yes. I think that I've really come into balancing 
my feelings and my thoughts and sort of really empowering myself, coming into a position of listening to myself, both what I feel and what I'm thinking and working from that point. Um, after that car accident uh, in 2017, I I had a major concussion. It was the first time I'd ever been in an accident and gotten hurt. Um, and I was a little unhappy with my spirit team about that. But I recognized that just like in my near-death experiences, sort of two, three, and four, it was this ability to see the truth about the people around me and the way that they do and don't express feelings and the value that they place on me and my ability to express myself. And since then, I've worked really hard at being very clear and articulate with what I believe and what I feel and not backing down um, to peer pressure, not backing down to or doormatting for other people. Um, so I found that I also completely allowed myself to step into my, my gifts, my intuition, my ability to sense things. Mm -hmm. And that just keeps broadening and I keep discovering more. Do you feel like the archangel was communicating with you with the rectangle? Yeah, that symbol, yes, because, you know, it, by the time we got to what I call the book ending, um, I just, I knew when I looked at it, I'm like, you know, because my friend was like, oh, I know how this ends. And I'm like, no, it doesn't end that way. I, I knew it's like, no, that was sent to get you out of this. You know what I mean? And in some cases, that's really the whole point is we all have our own way of communicating with our spirit team, our own way of understanding our gut instincts and our intuition. And that language is very personal. And for me, the idea of symbols and things has always been a part of it. And so when I look at something, especially those rectangles that come out of the snow you know, and I can't see, but I know I can't veer to the right where the road is supposed to eventually, you know, come into a, a clearing of some place where you could safely park. It was like, no, I knew I needed to stay in the third lane. I was comfortable in that lane. And it, it didn't even take five minutes for them to send me that help. Mm. And it was the rectangle again. Would it be true to say that your life was saved each time by Archangel Michael or Megatron? Yeah, I would say that my spirit team. Um, I think the direction of the things happening. So things like, you know, if you look at a transport truck, especially I do today, and I smile because it's like, it had to be the right type of transport because most of them now have these strange guard things. So people don't hydroplane under them, or they have those extra set of legs that when they're parked, they're stabilized. Had any of those things been there? that I would have touched on that, which would have sent the truck flying because we were both flying down the road like well over 100. Mm. Um, and it would have had a really different outcome. So there's definitely something bigger that lines things up, you know, divine timing and order. I absolutely believe in synchronicities. Mm -hmm. I've seen them my whole entire life. I've experienced them. I've watched other people experience them. And it just, it's a peaceful place for me. I notice that you keep using the word team. Who else is a part of your team? So I would say there are definitely angels, both guardian angels, um, as well as archangels. The difference between them, I don't really know. I'm not really worried about, but there is that angelic feel. And then what I call guides, um, which are comprised of souls who have never been in form and some who are souls who I've known along the way who are no longer here. Um, I get a definitive sense at times when they're around. Um, if they're loved ones, um, I get the scent. So for example, for my yaya, which is Greek for grandmother, um, if she wants me to know that she's with me going through what I'm going through, 
then I get the smell of her cooking spinach pie Mm. and, you know, and it shows up in a place where there's no way anyone's cooking spinach pie. Mm -hmm. If it's my other grandmother, I smell a nail polish remover. I I was standing in the middle of the crossing the road one day and all of a sudden there was nail polish remover all the way around me. And I'm like, okay, (laughs) I acknowledge you. So, I get these different little cues when they are people who were in my life, when they're guides who I don't believe have been in form, then there's a different feeling, but it's still this feeling that there's somebody standing right next to you. And the feeling is you're safe and you're just going to keep going. And they're right there with you. And it usually happens when I'm making decisions or I'm feeling a little, out of sorts and it's like okay you're not alone keep going are there any other ways that you feel like these experiences have changed you um yeah i would say that they really make me value connection they show me the value of being me and the value of seeing other people as who they are um I can see a lot of potential in people and sometimes that gets in the way of seeing their, what they're actually doing at the moment. So for example, with the people in the boating incident, there were other things going on that I was not aware of. Um, And I wasn't looking for cues about people's personal lives and their own struggles and things. Um, But now I really trust what I learned um, when I was 11 and 12, which was the lesson of words and actions. Uh, My dad's a politician. So when he got into politics, you know, people come up and say the craziest things to people's kids. And it doesn't matter how you can be 11 and they'll tell you how much they hate your father Mm. uh, and they don't like his theories or his politics. And they're just so I'd get very upset. And so one day he sat me down and he said, it's like this words and actions. Talk is cheap. Actions will always tell you the truth. And he said, and I don't care who they are and I don't care what the situation is. And he's like, so you need to pay less attention to the words and more to the actual actions. And so I really, after these events in working my way through understanding them for myself, but then also trying to understand well, like, what what was it to the other person? I started to really see where the truth in people's actions had been telling me that these things were going to change. And that's what I think my near-death experiences were. They were pivotal moments. They were things that changed trajectories of relationships that really weren't healthy for myself or the other person, whether I understood the the idiosyncrasies of what was going on or the truth behind it all, it it removed me from relationships and situations that I'm grateful that it did. They were blind sides. They were tough and challenging. There were a lot of tears, but I came out the other side going, okay, it, it left for a reason. And sometimes it would take six or seven days or six or seven weeks. I think six months was the longest And then something would happen, a piece of information that would show up. uh, And I'd be like, oh, yeah, no, I didn't want any part of that. That that wasn't where I was supposed to be. That wasn't what I was supposed to be doing. They just kept pivoting me onto my path. Do you have a religious background or not? And if so, would you consider these experiences religious or spiritual? I would consider them spiritual. Um, I was not raised with organized religion. In fact, um, both my parents and their families had a rather tough time with uh, organized religion. And so um, they were spiritual. And we had friends who we spent a lot of time with in we were introduced to people who were past life regressionists and tarot card readers and trans channelers and people who um, looked at biorhythms, who did Reiki, who were into astrology. Um, And so as little girls, um, 
they followed their curiosity and we were right there with them. And so it, it led to meeting a lot of interesting people, um, both in my family's business, uh, in my father's political life, and then in this totally different and separate world of people who believed in energy, who believed in something much bigger and greater than just ourselves. What inspires you most about your experiences? I think that when I share them um, with people and when things in my life are changing and I'm now feeling like I have more of a say in the way that I pivot and I'm more connected to the energies around and my ability to read them, that really inspires me. And it inspires me to instill that in other people, like see how you're part of a bigger picture and you matter to the bigger picture because they show up for you. They don't have to show up for you in a near death experience. Those things that you call coincidences, those are synchronicities. Those are perfectly placed things that move you along and bring you into relationships, situations, and circumstances that are a reflection of like what you need, uh, what you need to learn, what you need to have in your life now. And I try not to judge them because this idea of good or bad doesn't really, at the end of the day, it doesn't overly matter because something can look really bad on the outside to us. Like most people would look at those accidents as an incident and be like, that sucks for you. And I'm like, yeah, from the outside looking in, but from the inside looking out, from the personal, and that's what they are, they're personal experiences. They opened me up. They reminded me to stay curious. They reminded me that there is something way bigger going on and I matter it to it as much as it matters to me now. Do you feel like you have this communication issue resolved where you now will not have any more NDEs? Yeah. Um, I felt that when I, you know, at the, when we followed that transport out, but in the last, since that time, I've really worked hard at being very clear with people. And since that, I have, I'm going to call it cleaned up some imbalances in relationships where people just assumed that Angela would stay the United Nations, um, that she would doormat to people. And it was like, yeah, no, I have a purpose and I have worthiness and value and there are things that I deserve and they aren't going to be doled out by other people. They're going to be the consequences of my actions, words, intentions, and the things that I do. And so I really feel like I stepped into self-awareness and self-empowerment and self-discovery. All right. I'm going to switch gears on you here. You are okay. a fellow YouTube content creator. So what is the name of your channel? Butterfly Creations. Butterfly Creations. Do you have any other social media outlets with that name? Our title um we have uh so we have a website we have instagram we're working on the facebook um those are sort of the, the basic social media platforms we're still expanding it's a very new channel mm -hmm. i started it about eight months ago um and we just recently sort of re i, I today actually i just relaunched uh the website because it was like about three months ago, it was like, you need to, you're a whole package and you need to honor that. And so I, it was like, no, I'm, I'm taking down the, uh, the final walls, you know? And it's like, this is me. This is how I work, the things I've experienced. And I encourage other people to follow their uniqueness. What kind of content do you create on your channel? Um, so I do an intuitive weekly message called Expressions of Love. Um, I started the channel with that message. I used to use Oracle cards, 
Um, and then one day I just flipped on the camera and set the Oracle cards to the side and I just let my intuition talk and the messages come through me. I'm an intuitive channel. Um, usually I do it through writing, but since starting the channel, it's definitely, you know, more speaking directly to people. And so every week I flip on the camera and we talk about the things that not only am I feeling energetically and seeing it reflected in the world around me, but also what I'm hearing from other people, both uh, people on my channel, um, other channels on YouTube. And it's like those synchronicities, I try to pull them together. Um, I do do a near death experience uh, video series every Thursday. Um, I really delve into my experiences in terms of what I've learned. And the last couple of weeks, again, it's changed and I'm flipping on the camera and I've had every time I have a new epiphany, a new way of a piece of information seeming to broaden for me. I'll flip on the camera and while I'm in the process of working it out and talking it out, I talk it out with my viewers. I also do um, two tarot readings a week, pick a cards. Um, because again, I read my tarot and oracles completely intuitively, not formally trained, not someone who can memorize things and certainly not after uh, the concussion that I had memory work i can i can remember the things i have to but i'm not interested in sitting down and reading a book and trying to commit things to memory never been that person um and reading the tarot cards in terms of a pick a card it's my way of meeting people where they are meaning the three energies the three most prominent messages come out and that is more helpful to more people in my way because I also encourage people to use their intuition based on something I say, a title, a color in a card. It doesn't all have to mean something to you, but if you're drawn to it, there's some piece in there. It might be a word, a symbol. It could be a card that just, you know, suddenly feels like you were given the answer. And so these are the things that I do on my channel. Do you have any projects that you're working on that you want us to know about? Yeah. So I wrote a book. Um, and so my Monday message is called Expressions of Love. And so what I've learned is that my expression of love, my way of connecting is I'm the person who shows up. I'm the person who shows up sometimes when nobody else does. Um, and so I wrote a book about my journey, about my healing. Um, and so on my website, butterflycreations.ca, there is uh, the information about the book. It's currently in the editing process. I'm hoping before the end of the summer it will be live, but the information is there. I also am working on an Oracle deck. Um, it's the wisdom of the ancestors, their wisdom and their blessing. I connect with ancestor energy um, very clearly uh, because as a small child, my parents were very busy. I essentially spent a lot of time with my yaya and papu, Greek for grandma and grandpa, and then my uh, grandma and grandpa on the other side. I also had six grandparents until I was nine. So I had the privilege of knowing my great grandparents on one particular side and connecting with older people, older souls has always been my thing. Um, so that Oracle deck, uh, my mom is an intuitive and an artist. So she's completed the artwork and we're now in the process of I'm channeling the messages for the book that go with it. And I'm hoping that just into the new year that will, that will be ready for public sale. Mm, that's great. All right. Before we finish up here, do you have one last message that you'd like to share with the audience? I think that it's really great that there is a place now where people can share more about their near-death experiences. And I think it's really great that people are curious, even if you haven't, because the idea of us sharing these experiences so that not everyone has to have them, but you can 
learn and broaden your own self-awareness through hearing other people's stories. And for some people, I do do a workshop um, about near-death experiences along with several things. But when I do that workshop, I find most people come there curious. There are people who have had experiences, but in the curious audience, I've had at least one or two each time who suddenly break down in the middle of the workshop because they realize what they had was a near-death experience. A lot of times people think it's just this, that it's only medical, that it is, you know, completely leaving your body, having a physical death. And I'm like, no, when time goes void or slows down, when physics and gravity alter in, in ways that, you know, scientists say it can't happen that is running your hand along the edge of death and being safe and cocooned because it's not your time but they want your attention because there are things that need to change there are things about to change and you become hyper aware of yourself and your surroundings and I think that really helps you go through some of the bigger changes And so when we share these things, maybe some people who are about to go through some bigger changes or have start to really look at the bigger picture for themselves and really tune in to their own feelings and their own thoughts and silence the doubters and the outside voices. Thank you for that message, Angela. And thank you for being my guest. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I wish you massive success with your book. Great. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. All right. Have a great evening. You too. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.